I want to pray for all of us that we might have alert minds and that our hearts and our, our minds might be open and um, receptive to whatever the Lord has to share. Last year, I shared a message relating to the nature, uh, the makeup of human nature. You know, this is one of the things that um, it causes a lot of controversy, um, especially in our circles. There, there are all these arguments about the nature of Christ, the nature of man, the nature of sin. I believe that once we get the biblical picture right, everything begins to fit into place. And last year I, I shared a sermon um, relating to how human nature can be compared to the sanctuary. There's a message called the Living Temple, which is online if you would like to see. But I want to build on that a little bit this morning, and I want to show how human nature is clearly illustrated in something else. And um, what I'm going to talk about this morning is um, computers, salvation, and human nature. It, it may be a little challenging because... I don't know how familiar we are with the workings of a computer. And maybe usually, especially for older folks, it's a little challenging. Maybe for the young people it's like bread and butter, but it's a little harder for us older ones. But I think I understand enough that I can maybe kind of break it down. Because I believe there's a, there, are, there are very valuable lessons we can learn. And um, it, it kind of makes sense because... The computer is man's effort to, to create intelligence, to create something that is almost alive. You know, not, uh, these days they have robots, and they are, they, are, they are creating something that they call artificial intelligence. And it started, the idea of it, and the possibility of it began with the invention of the computer. I'm going to put it to you that the, the computer is the closest thing man has ever made to, to parallel the makeup of a living thing. There's nothing else. I mean, motor cars, they're machines. They have no mind. They move strictly because you push buttons and you, you tell it exactly what to do at every step. But the computer is a little different. It has abilities that a car doesn't have. And in fact, they're getting cars to be more efficient now by putting computers, a kind of computer, in, in, in the machinery of the car. Everything is going that way, right? Aeroplanes, all are, now they have cars that drive themselves, and it's all based on computerization. The most sophisticated computer that was ever designed is the human body. Long, long before man ever dreamed of computers, somebody infinitely more intelligent designed probably the, probably the greatest computer that ever, was ever, ever made, and it was the human body. What I want to do today is to make a parallel between the computers designed by men and the computer of the human body to show you that, to show you something about ourselves that we might not have understood before, but that is very important for us to understand. And the context of this discussion is that there is a dilemma in Christian thinking. There is confusion in Christian thinking, and I'm going to put it to you what this confusion is about. Martin Luther coined this phrase. I don't know if he coined it, but he used it. If you have been involved in um, studying the Reformation or studying justification, you'll come upon this phrase, simul justus et peccator. It's a, it's a Latin phrase. And it really means, at the same time, just and unjust. At the same time, pure and impure. Martin Luther, it, it, it became almost the catchword of the Reformation. Because their understanding of righteousness led them to the conclusion that the Christian is at the same time impure and pure. Um, it actually means, as I said, pure yet impure at the same time. Now, I grew up as an Adventist and, and I faced this question from the very beginning. From the moment I was converted. Before I was converted, I didn't care. I didn't know anything about it. But when I, when I was converted... I, I rapidly got into these kinds of, of, of studies, justification, sanctification, perfection, and I became very familiar with these issues. And one of the things that came to me 
based on my, my environment was that our religion is a search for perfection. And I viewed this perfection as being a state where I would never do a wrong action. As a matter of fact, I came to understand it is a condition where I never think a wrong thought. I don't know if you have ever been there. But when you think of perfection in terms of performance, I become so good that not even my thoughts have a scar. There's no smear in my mind, not just in my behavior. Have you ever been, been, tried to be perfect that way? I labored. I labored, I labored, I labored because it's hard work. It becomes harder when you realize that you're not getting there. It becomes harder when 30 years have passed and you're still at square one. The thing about trying to be perfect in that way, like I said yesterday, you have a thousand, you have 10,000 ways you can behave. You try to be perfect in 10,000 different things. You try to be perfect. I remember one morning I was jogging and I recognized that you know, my mind follows a pattern. I see something and it triggers a thought. And I saw something and I recognized that my mind was trying to think of something. And I tried, I fought it for half a mile. I fought, I thought, I thought of everything. I started thinking of other things to, 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 to reject this thought and to make sure it never came into my mind. I started thinking about this, that, and in the back of my mind, I thought I was just relaxing and waiting. <laughs> And I, after half my it just jumped at me and I just said, let me get it over with and done. And I just started and I, then I moved on. And I felt defeated, but I thought, what else can I do? Now, this is the kind of, it, it, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's associated with other religions or, or other, other religious groups, but I know that in my, in my Adventist environment, this is what, I viewed, this is how I viewed perfection. Now I am 42 years down the road since I became a Christian. And like I, I said, 13 years ago my understanding began to change. But here's what I still find. I find that in Christianity, in my experience, in your experience, in the experience of the folk I, 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 I worship among, there are still two different realities. The two realities are this. On the one hand, we have the fact that when a person is born again, he has become a new creation. I think I have the verses, so let me, let me go ahead of myself. I, I have my PowerPoint, and very often I don't follow it. The thoughts get jumbled up. So if I jump back and forth, you understand. I'm kind of winging it, following my thoughts as I go along. Um, I, I am one person when I became a Christian, well, not when I became a Christian, when I came to understand righteousness by faith, 13 years ago, I came to the conclusion that when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I gave my life to Christ by faith, I was born again. And when I was born again, I changed. And when you change, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, I'm sure you know the verse. It says, if any man is in Christ, he's what? A new creature, I understand that the, the Greek actually says a new creation. Old things have passed away. How does it end? All things have become new. Come on, that's too extreme. All? Give me a break. Can, can anybody here honestly say I've taken hold of the verse and this is what I find? All things have become new. You know. That the way we have viewed things, it is not true. And yet I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying that superficially it appears that it is not true. Because I remember, I was ambushed by that thought when I was jogging. Things that I did when I was 15, 10, 5, they remain. They stay with me. Okay? I, I, I've never been... I used, to have, I used to be a terrible, terrible boy before I became a Christian. But I remember one time I went to a supermarket and I stole some stuff. Okay? I stole some stuff, stuffed things in my pocket and in my shirt. And I got caught. I mean, I, rec I, I have recovered over the years. Okay? I have recovered over the years. But I don't forget those things. 
I remember things I did that I'm ashamed of. I remember things I did that were dis despicable. I, will, I did not have a noble childhood. Like some people can say, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Like some people can say, I, I was raised and I had a good moral upbringing. I never got into those kinds of things. I was not so. I got into dirt. So, I don't forget. I don't want to remember, but I don't forget. And yet you say, I have become a new creature, and all things have become new. How do you explain that? And so Christians have this conflict where, even in our movement, there is a debate going on. Sometimes it becomes more than a debate, it becomes a conflict. Where some people say, when the, the Christian life is an experience of being instantly changed, I am in that, in that group. But there's another set of Christians who say, another set of our brethren who say the Christian life is a product of gradual conflicts and victories and gradual educating of the mind. And as we, as we dig into the Bible and we begin to understand more and more, you are gradually changed. And those brethren will sit on the verses that say, by beholding we are changed. Is it a matter of either or either? Uh, is, is one side right and one wrong? Or is there some way that we can understand that there is not a contradiction? This is the dilemma I want to settle for us today. And I believe it is absolutely beautifully settled by the word of God. And using the illustration I'm going to use, I think we can see it clearly. So... First thing I want to say is that we have always understood man to be made up of body and spirit. That's the, the thing we emphasize a lot. Body and spirit. As a matter of fact, it used to be that where I came from, they said body and breath. Because it's almost like they never believed that man has a spirit. But I think we who belong to the movement that emphasizes the truth about God, we have gotten to the place where we, we believe that the spirit is an actual component that is inside of man. Well, some of us I know right now there is a debate going on because some people are saying that the spirit is more the product of the words that we read. As we read and study the word, we change inside and we develop a different spirit. I know that I and many others believe that the spirit is a component that comes from God. It's a supernatural element that actually comes to inside of you. Something is added to your existence miraculously, supernaturally, instantaneously by God, and you are transformed by this element. That's what I believe. But there's a, a discussion going on, and I have to tell you the truth about the other side. There are brethren, very, very knowledgeable brethren, who are now countering that idea, and they say the spirit is related to the words. They say the spirit cannot work outside of the words. Some of them are even saying that the spirit is a combination of the thoughts, God's thoughts, imparted to you through the words, and in some, in some cases, the Spirit refers to the angels. If you have never seen that discussion, you probably are not a person who follows what's going on on Facebook. But those of us who are there, we know what's, what, what's going on. So, body and spirit, even on that, we don't have a common understanding. But I, I'm saying that what I believe and what I'm sharing with you today is that the Spirit of God is, a, is something that actually... It's a supernatural element, the best way I can use it. An element, I don't want to use the word substance lest I be understood, but it's an element, it's an energy, it's an aspect of God that actually comes to dwell inside of us, to be fused with our spirit, bringing an instant change to the spiritual nature of a person. So we understand about these two parts, however we define it. But... The Apostle Paul suggests that there are at least three parts. I think Jesus mentioned four, right? Jesus said, I pray God that your... No, Jesus says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, one, with all your soul, two, with all your mind, three, and with all your strength, four. Jesus said four. But I'm looking at what Paul said today because that's the perspective I want to approach this study from. Paul says... And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body 
be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks about three components. Body, spirit, soul. Three. Now, the body, the spirit, and the soul. I've illustrated it here in this way. Now, the body, I believe, to be the physical part. Everybody will agree with that. I won't, I won't say much about that. What about the soul? Well, that's kind of really difficult to define. I know that we, we, we have always said body plus spirit makes a soul. So a soul is something that, that has a combination of spirit and body. But when you look at what Paul says, that's not how he says it. He says your body plus your spirit plus your soul. Three different aspects that make up one person. And I'm going to show you why it's reasonable, it's logical, it makes sense. Now the soul, what is it? I understand the soul to be also based on the physical. I'm going to define them for you. And then afterwards we're going to look at why I define them this way. The body is the genetic structure. Everything you got, you got genetically is your body. Including your brain. Everything that can go back to the ground and rot is your body. So what is your soul? Before I come to the soul, let me go to the spirit. The spirit is something that is not based in genetics. The scripture says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 that when a person dies, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. James says the body without the spirit is dead. When Jesus was dying, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Paul talks about a man in 1 Corinthians 5 who took his mother's who took his father's wife. He took his stepmother and had relations with her. And Paul says, I want, when, you're, when you come together, bind that man over to Satan so his body might be destroyed, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Don't ask me what he meant. I don't have a clue. I'm wondering myself. But he clearly makes a distinction between the body and the spirit. The body can be destroyed and the spirit is saved. So what I, what I want to say is that in my understanding, the spirit is that part of us that is really us. Because when you die, your body is rotting and it's going away and the breeze will blow it about and it will never come back. But you will continue. You will come back. You will sleep and you will come back. And when you come back, it won't be because the body is recreated. It will be because, it will be because there's a part of you that remains, even though it is sleeping, but it remains, and that part is a real you, and that part is a spirit. So the spirit is not just a collection of thoughts. I wanted to deal with a collection of thoughts, but the spirit is some essential element that makes you who you are. When I was a young Christian, I said to my father, Daddy, if I die, how, how, how am I coming back in the resurrection? I said, suppose I drown at sea and I get eaten by fish. And then people catch a fish and they eat the fish. Then what was me becomes a part of other people. So how, how am I coming back in the resurrection? And he said, God is able to bring back somebody just like you. That's the words he used. And I, I got really worried. Because it's like he was saying, my twin is coming back. And that's what really set me to study this thing. Because I thought, no, God is not like that. My twin that's fine for the twin, but what about me? <laughs> and so I realized that there has to be some way to preserve the reality that I myself survive from this life to the next life, and it's not my body. That's what made me understand that the spirit is not just a collection of thoughts or thought processes. There's something more to it, and it helps me to better understand the spirit of God and the spirit of man. So, the spirit is that element that is... Uh, it, in Zechariah 12 and verse 1, it says, The Lord forms the spirit of man within him. So, body plus spirit makes a living soul. Now, where the body and the spirit meet, you have the soul. And I'm going to explain that with the computer, but I'm just going to say it to you now. The soul is the place where the body and the spirit meet. The soul is based upon the physical it involves your thought processes, your information, 
how you, in, how you think. Your conscious mind. And so when your body dies, your conscious mind stops functioning, your thought processes cease, but all of that, God keeps a record of it. And when he reunites it with the spirit, you come back to life. Anyway, let me not get ahead of myself. I have already done that. Spirit is non-physical, the body is physical, and the soul is based on the physical, based in the physical. But it's not really physical because it's like a product of the physical and the spirit, spirit together. And I will explain. So, let's go to the computer because like I said, the computer is the closest thing that was ever made, that man ever made to the human body. When man started to try to design artificial intelligence, he had to go this road. There's no other way you can de design it other than by taking the same pattern that God made. I don't think man started out to pattern the human being. Because the first computers were extremely primitive. I had one of the old VIC-20s, Commodore 64. Those of you over 90, you can remember. But the, 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 the system began to develop, improve, until we have what we have today, until man is pretty close to the place where he can make something that looks and functions just like you to such, an, such a degree that you won't know the difference. Man is close to that place. Interact, speak, hold a conversation, make decisions, take information and sort it and come up with solutions just like a human being. He's almost there. The only thing he can't do, of course, is give the spark of life. But let's see what comparisons there are and what we can learn from making the comparison. The body corresponds to the hardware. Now you know hardware, it refers to those parts of the computer that are, that are material, physical. You have like the fan, you have like the, the, the different disc, the floppy disk. I don't think we use that much anymore. You have the power supply, the motherboard, the processors. All that is manufactured, material things. We call that the hardware. And this corresponds, of course, to the human body. Your muscles, your bone structure, your cells, everything that is, as I said, genetic. This corresponds to the computer body. Um, it's, it's, the housing, it's the housing and the organs that enable you, the living organism, to function and to interact with the world around you. Same thing with the computer. It's the housing and the machinery that enables the computer to, to operate. And of course, we had this verse already, I'll bypass it. Then you have the input devices. You have, what are the input devices? They are the things that you use to feed information into the computer. Like the joystick, if you, if you play games. You have the keyboard, which is what I mostly use. You have the scanner, you put images on the computer. You have the mouse, where you, you can also input information. So, and you have different, you have different ways. You have the camera. Other, other ways. You, have, you can have a, uh, a microphone. So it's the way you put information into the computer. And your body is very similar because you have the five senses. These are your input devices, okay? Your eyes see things. Since I came here this morning, I learned so much with my eyes. I looked at your faces and I learned something about how you're feeling this morning. I looked at the things you were how you were interacting with each other. I looked at the people who were coming in and I learned things. Then my ears also put information and where does it go? It's all going into my brain, right? It's going into my brain. We have these five senses and they are our input devices. Now, the next part, th this is a physical part of the body. The next part is what I call the soul. And the soul, as I said, is a combination of body and spirit. And we'll see how that, that ties in. Now the memory is involved in what I call the soul. <coughs> and in the computer you have the hard drive. And the basic purpose of the hard drive, some of you might be much better at this than me. I don't know of any purpose for the hard drive other than to hold data. That might include the operating system, but it's still data. So the hard drive is the memory where all the data is stored. And um, you also have another kind of memory which is called... RAM, these memory sticks, and what they do, 
they give the computer room to process the information that it takes in. The information is stored here. This is storage of information. But if you have information, you still have to work with the information. It's like, it's like you're a painter. You have red, red paint and you have blue paint. But it's sitting there. It's no good apart from just sitting there. The only time it becomes effective now, you put a brush in it and you start using it. Then it becomes effective. And you can do, you can mix blue and red and, and get mauve or purple. You can mix blue and yellow and you get green. And so you can start in using the, 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 the data you have, combining it and coming up with other, other results. That's what the computer memory, that's what the RAM does. It takes the information you have stored here or that you put on with your keyboard and so on. It takes this information and it begins to process it. It, begins to, it gives you room for, for that information to, to be put to work. I hope I don't lose you there. If you're not too computer savvy, it might, it might bypass you. But, but it's not critical. You just need to know that the memory is where the data is stored. And that data is also utilized in different ways. Now, let me get ahead of myself a little bit. Your brain, your brain is not you. Your brain is simply a processing machine that takes in information. The way we see the world is often based on what the brain is telling us and what do we get from the brain. One of the things that was most striking to me was the awareness that I can never have perfect faith if I base it on what is in my brain. You know why? When I was young, I read books about evolution. I have negative and positive in my mind. Do I ever forget? You don't forget. It's not God's plan yet to take away those memories. Those memories are still stuck in your brain while you are here in this existence. So you, you want to have perfect faith. You know how you could have perfect faith? If all the information you ever had was only positive. When I say all the information, I mean it's not like Howard and I went and prayed for this, this lady up in Georgia. And we prayed so earnestly and when we... When we left, she was still in the same condition. What does that do to perfect faith? Perfect faith is if every time you pray, you see an answer. If you are basing it on information. You cannot have perfect faith if you base it on information upon what happens inside of your conscious mind. Because you all have negative and positive information. It might be 60, 40. You can't have perfect faith that way. And so, one of the most liberating moments to me was when I came to realize that faith is not a function of the brain. True faith does not function from the brain. We Christians try that the wrong way. I try to have faith by putting information in my brain. That's not how faith comes. But I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to the, 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 the main point. But I want to, to throw that in there. So, your brain is simply a place where information is stored and it is processed. Okay? What comes out of your brain is based on what is put into your brain. You are... And maybe I should not say... Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not going to say this. Because it's, I'm going to say it. But I'm going to tell you that it's not the truth. But I'm going to say it anyway. Most people believe, this is true, most people believe that you are the product of the information you put in your brain and it, it determines how you see and view life. And that is true to a large extent, but it is, not, it is not true in the absolute sense. It's a misconception and it's the reason why we get so frustrated. People try to change by putting information in the computer. They try to change by putting information on the hard drive. Well, if you could go through and delete all the negative information, fine. You know, I said it last year. Well, we weren't here last year. I think we were up in Spokane. But I said it there. Some of us were there. But I'm going to say it again. You know, we had two brethren in Jamaica who... They got into... Um, they, they, they got sick. One of them... 
lost his mind. Uh, I think he had a stroke or something like that. Lost his mind. A man who had been a Christian for a long time, maybe 40 years. Very gentle old man. Beautiful Christian. When he lost his mind, he started to tell people bad words. He started to curse his family. What do people think when that happens? They think this was inside of him all along. He was never a Christian. The other one was a sister. She started having seizures. On one occasion, she went into the pharmacy and started to strip off her clothes. What do you think when things like this happen? This person could never be a Christian. This is because we have this misconception that Christian experience and the Christian life depends upon the information in the brain. And we don't understand the brain as opposed to the spirit. We don't understand the soul as distinct from the spirit. And I'm ahead of myself, but I'm going to get down to my point in a little bit. So, in your hard drive or in your brain, you have this information. On the computer, what we do, we install software. And we have the software installed. We install software too because we go to school and you start learning, right? Um, Steve has some very good software to do with um, carpentry and um, woodwork. And um, I don't know the profession of most of us, right? I have a little, hard, I have a little bit of hard, hard, uh, software installed to do with artwork, right? A lot of us have, have software dealing with biblical information and, and so on, okay? We, we find ourselves excelling in certain areas of life based on the software that we install, the information we put in, and the programs to run that information. So, very, com very much paralleling the computer. Just like how the keyboard inputs information, we are inputting information by going to university or school and studying. The computer does the same thing, we do the same thing. Now, Paul speaks of this process, and Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is he saying? He's saying put in new data. Put in new software. All right? Every time I, I, I get a new computer, the first thing I do is I load it up with software. Then afterward, I start putting on data. Right? I get all my information from my documents and my old, old files, and I make sure I put them there. But I have to have the software to run that data, right? So I install Microsoft Word and PageMaker and my video editing software because those are, the, that, that is the, those are the processes that make the information functional, allow me to access and to use the information. So Paul says that one of the things we Christians need to do, we need to be changed, but we are changed by the renewing of our mind, by putting new information in our minds. Sometimes we even need to install new software, new abilities to do different things when we become Christians. And so many Christians grab this verse and they say, this is a process of Christian living. But no, that's not true. It's one aspect, but it is, a, it, is, it is a secondary aspect. We have not yet reached the first aspect, which is the most important aspect. I'm coming to that. Peter says along the same line, and besides this giving all diligence, Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. This is the development of char character. It is not the way you become a Christian. Did you get what I said? I don't know if you believe it, but I want to make sure you heard. This is the development of character. It is not the way you become a Christian. So, because Christianity is not by evolution. It's not by gradual development. It's by a miracle. And the miracle is called what? Birth. When you have a birth that takes several, several hours, the child is likely to end up an imbecile or dead. Am I right, Sister Linda? Right. I, I, I've never been there, but ladies have told me. And I... 
Birth was designed by God to be a, a, a moment, a moment's experience. It wasn't intended to be a, a, a long, drawn-out, sustained thing because it is dangerous to the new child and to the parent when it happens this way. And God tells us that the Christian experience is based upon birth. Not development or evolution. But I'm not denying that development takes place for the Christian. It's character development, but it is not the way you become a Christian. It's the way you might grow as a Christian. Let's not make a mistake about that. So, I'm saying that the soul... Well, I'm going to go there. The soul is a processor. Now, in the computer, you have something called a processor. And maybe we are... We are con we are confused about what this process is about. So we have the body. And then you have the hard drive where all the memory and the data is stored. So what is this processor? The processor is a place where all the information is taken and it is combined and sifted and sorted. And it comes up with new ideas and new creation. Okay? You can create things on your computer. But do you think you really create anything? What you do is take what is already there and you recombine it to come up with ideas and things that did not appear at the start. But it comes out because you are processing that information and recombining it. And that is how your mind works. You can't create anything no matter how hard you try. You can only re in, re recombine the ideas you have in your mind and come up with different combinations of those ideas. And I'll give you an example. I'd like you to think of a color that you never saw. Or, or, or tell me about a musical note that you never heard. I mean, I just give you those examples because you can't. You can't. We are not creators. We were made to be, we were made to recombine the things God has created and come up with fresh perspectives. But you can't create anything. Because there's only one creator. Maybe when you get to heaven, you'll see colors that you never saw before. You're not going to see them in this light because you can't think of it. You don't have the capacity to go beyond what has already impacted on your mind. So, this is how your mind works. It takes information, okay? And sometimes it comes up with wrong conclusions. I know that when somebody frowns at me, they probably are thinking negatively towards me. Information, click, that goes into the, into the database. I know that when I wave at somebody and they don't wave back, negative informi ne they're feeling negative towards me. Click, that goes into my database, right? So si I see Sister Denny this morning and her face is kind of frowning. And I wave at her and she doesn't wave back. And my brain goes, click, click, click. Denny has hard feelings against me for some reason. And I start thinking, I better keep out of her way today. When absolutely, there was nothing like that. She just didn't see when I waved. And she was concentrating on something while her brows were knitted. But my database has combined information based on past information that I have. And it comes up with a, an answer that is completely wrong. And very often that's what happens. We are the, we are the product and our behavior is often the product of the, the data that is in the computer. And how our processor works with it. And recombines it. This is our minds, our conscious mind. It's, our, it's our, what some people call the soul. And your conscious mind is simply a processing tool. And the products of that processing process. You process information, you come up with, with things. And very often the, the things you come up with may be true. May be far from truth. May be far from reality, right? Somebody came to Jamaica... They came to our camp meeting and somebody was telling him it's a dangerous place and so forth. So he was sleeping in, in, in the room upstairs at Howard's home. But everybody else was at the camp meeting. And in the night he got up and was thinking about how dangerous it was. And he, he took out his knife and put it under his pillow. <laughs> now, was there any danger? He was as safe as a chicken under his mother's wings. But the data in his brain and all he had heard got him to the place where he, 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 took, he took action, he took out his knife and put it under his pillow. It was not a real world. It was imaginary, but it was based on the data that was put into his brain. And his brain is coming up with 
pictures and solutions that maybe don't make any sense, but it makes sense to him because of what is the data that is in there. You will understand that if Christianity is based or are dependent upon the data in your brain, you're going to have a very hard Christian life because you have been learning negative and positive all your life. And even when you start putting in the positive, you begin to think differently, but you never ever leave the negative behind. Part of the problem with the environment I grew up in is because my religion was an intellectual religion. I don't know, maybe yours was different. It was very intellectual. Everything was based upon understanding doctrine correctly. Our place with God, our, our acceptance with God was often understood to be dependent upon our careful definition of doctrine. I've wondered why. In Adventism, you have more offshoots than any other group in the world. Well, I don't know every other group, right? I don't know every other denomination. But I can tell you, I've heard people say it and I've thought about it because I can start naming offshoots. They are there by the dozen, starting from, from the shepherd rod back, shepherd rods back in the 1920s and maybe before that. And then you had Brinsmead in the 60s. And then you had Desmond Ford. And then you have, you have the shepherd's rod have 26 different offshoots from the shepherd's rod. Right? And then you have, you had... Ron Spear, John Grosbold, John Osborne, David Mould, those were the big names back in the, in the 70s, 80s. And then when the Godhead movement came up, you had, of course, you had the Reform Adventist Church from 1914. And then they split into two and became two different branches of reform. And in the Godhead movement now, you have the feast-keeping Godhead believers. You have the God does not kill believe, uh, Godhead believers. You have the Born, sinless, God of believers, and they would put me in the camp of the born, sinners, God of believers. And look here. Every time you divert from me by one degree, you go east and I go left and I go west. Because our religion is based on doctrinal purity. We never stop to consider that we ourselves are not doctrinally pure. But as soon as somebody digresses from what we believe, we're gone. Because it's the, it's the nature of how we see things. We have based our religion upon intellectual purity, intellectual understanding. And I'm saying it's a misconception. God does not judge us this way. God does not divide us that kind of way. It's a human paradigm that is false. Because if you are looking for purity of Perfection in your understanding. I wish you well. You got a long, long way to go. The very basis on which you are searching is wrong. And we should have learned from the Jews because they had everything perfect. They had everything right. Because what? They had a man who, who went up on the mountain and God spoke to him for 80 days. 80 days. Goodness gracious me. He must have gotten all the light in the world. 80 days is a long time. And the Jews knew. And when this man came along, what they had to say was, we know that Moses spoke, God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't know where he came from. And the man was raising the dead. And um, even a blind man had to teach them something. He said, this is a strange thing. He opened the eyes of a man born blind, and you don't know where he came from? This didn't matter to them. What mattered was, they knew everything. And what they knew was if this man even went up to heaven or parted the Red Sea or made the sun stand still in the sky, he would not be of God because he was not saying what Moses said. Because they, they defined their relationship with God by their doctrines. And you know, the thing is that they knew the doctrines, but they did not know the God of the doctrines. That was a real problem. They did not know the God of the doctrines. Because doctrines have a place and a time. Doc doctrines are set in a certain context. One time it was right to stone sinners. One time it was right to slaughter a lamb. One time it was right to practice the rituals of the law. God gave it. 
But they never understood the transition in time. They never un understood the purposes why God did this. And so they stuck to the forms and missed the meaning. We don't want to be in that place. Jesus says the servant does not know what his master is doing. But the, 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 the friend, I call you friends, we know what our master is doing. And so we don't, we don't worship blindly. We, we worship with understanding of what is happening. We know what. So, I'm saying all of this to say that when you look at the processing center, the, 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 the chip, all that it does, it takes information and processes it. What you get out of your computer, to a great extent, depends upon what you put into the computer. If you don't have a, a, a video editing program on your computer, you can't edit video. Okay, so, so somebody might give you a video and, and say, I want you to cut out certain parts. You can't do it because you don't have the program. You have to put that data on your computer in order to work with it, right? Somebody says, look here, I'd like to see what, uh, what Wagner says on the subject of the nature of sin. You don't have the data. You don't have the uh, Wagner's writings. You can't produce the result. But if you put that information there, you can find out what Wagner said, what Joan said, or, or so on, and you can come up with the data. And you can recombine it that you put your own commentary in there. So this is what the processor does. It takes your information and utilizes it in the way that you want to be done and pr produces a result. All right. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up soon. I know my time is going. It's a, a processor. And this is the way your brain works. It has memory and it has processing ability. Now, Paul says that we should think on the things that are pure, honest, lovely, good report. And so he's saying our processor should be taking these things and working on them because the brain, I'm, I'm saying clearly, the brain and the processing power that you have is how you develop character. Character is how you represent what is inside of you. It is not how you are saved. You are not saved by the character that you develop. You are saved by your birth. When a child is born, he doesn't have any character. But he begins to learn instantly. His eyes, his, his, his input system begins to work and he begins to take in information, hear things, learn things, and he begins to develop a character. And that's what happens when you as a Christian are born again. You begin to develop a character. and You, you want that character to, de to, to develop in a way that can glorify the Lord. You start putting good data into the, into the system. And so your character is developing in nature with your new birth. But it is not what saves you. You are saved because you are born again. You know, let me tell you something. I love to talk about my grandson because I'm learning a lot about God from my grandson. But you know, he came to the home. We like to have him come over and stay the night. He's five now, but this was about a year ago. He came and he said he's going, he, he stayed with us, with us a couple of nights and then he came back now and he said, yes, he wanted to stay with grandpa tonight. So, he came, they left his things, and his parents went home. About 10 o'clock, when we were getting ready for bed, he says, Okay, I'm ready to go home to my family now. <laughs> his grandmother and I were horror stricken. We said, Ken, you can't go home. You're staying here tonight. No, I want to go home. I, I, I only wanted to stay for a while. I said, Ken, your parents are gone home. It's 10 o'clock in the night. We got he insisted he wanted to go home. So I called his father. And his father rather grumpily agreed to come for him, so he's on the way. And then I said, Kate, if you go home tonight, you're not going to be able to stay here anymore. So anyway, his father came. When his father came, his father said, okay, get your things and let's go. He said, I'm not going home. <laughs> so now his father is really mad. I said, you made me come all this way. I know you don't. He said, Grandpa said, if, if I go home, I can't come back and stay <laughs> Around about that time, I start feeling like a dog. <laughs> I said, ah, okay, I'm sorry. He said, you're sorry? I said, yes. You apologize? Yes. You promise not to say it again? I said, yes. <laughs> he put me to the ringer. And, and so he went home. And then after he was gone, I was thinking, do I want my grandson to think that way that... that my acceptance of him is conditional upon his behavior. 
Do I want him to feel that if he doesn't behave a certain way, grandpa is not going to accept him? And it made me think about God. It made me understand about God. Okay? We have thought that God accepts us based on our performance. And if we don't perform right, you can't come back to my house. But the point I want to make is, why do I belong to God? It's for the same reason my grandson belongs to me. He's not my grandson because of how he behaves. He's my grandson because he's born. From the moment he was born, he was my grandson. Flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. And no matter what he did, he will always be and always have a place in my home. I was saved when I was born again. I became his family. Through his son, he sent his son to become my flesh and blood, to join my race. God joined the human race. And when I accepted it, he bound me to himself by a tie that can never be broken. Amen. We are saved by being born again, brothers and sisters. But at the same time, I want my grandson to grow up and to represent the family I write, right? So I'm going to see about his character development. <laughs> Okay, but his character development is not what makes him my grandson. No. From the moment he was born, he was in my home. And there to stay forever if I have anything to do with it. But, yes, develop character. Because we represent our father. So the blood that is in you, you want the character to develop in keeping with that, with that nature identity. So character development is important. But the problem is when people think we are saved by character development. Then they start thinking about salvation by works. About being accepted by performance. And if my character is not where it should be, I won't be saved. It puts people in, in a state of fear and in an attitude where they are, they, are, they are constantly grinding away to achieve their salvation in the hope that they can behave well enough to be accepted when they were already accepted in the beloved. So I touched on this. The output devices. That's your character. All right? On the computer, you put in your data and you process it and you process it and then it comes out through the printer. What do you see on the printer? You see a beautiful picture. Is that what is in the computer? First time I started using computers, my my my, my cousin said, What do you have that is responding when you type on the keyboard? Because he was used to the old typewriter, right? You press, bang, you hit the U, and a, a thing with a U, and it goes up, and bang, it hits the, the, the paper. There's a U on it, and it stamps the paper. So he's thinking the computer is something like that. So when I'm hitting the, the keys, something inside the computer is doing something. And I couldn't explain it properly to him at the time. But you know that when you hit the keyboard, or when you speak in the microphone, or when you look at the webcam, all that happens is that little electrical impulses are running up and down inside the, 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 the computer, right? Nothing else but electrical impulses. There is no red, there is no green, there is no blue, there are no pictures, there are no images. The computer takes that information and puts it together and creates something that you see as a picture. It's just little electrical impulses. So your output device is just an expression of how your processor puts the information together. And you find a way of putting it out. So, whether it's the speaker or the screen or the printer, it's a virtual world. Like I said, many times it's an imaginary world. You, you, you create images in your mind and you think things are so, and they're not really so. But it's based on how your processor works. So, what we see, even as we sit here this morning worshipping, is a product of how our processors have utilized the information that we put in our brains. Some of us might be a little grumpy, some of us might be very cheerful, some might be kind, some might be a little hard, some might be suspicious, some might be friendly, some might be open. It all depends upon the data and how we have processed it. But this is not what makes you a child of God. It only enables you to represent Him aright in the environment where you are. So, I'm going to just look at the final thing, which is a spirit which I'm going to compare to the operating system. Now, the operating system of a computer is the strangest thing of all because it has nothing to do with the processing or the 
software itself, well, in a secondary way, it has something to do with software, but I'm going to say this. When you think of Apple, who do you think about? Let me see. Steve Jobs. Thank you, Howard. It, anybody heard the name Steve Jobs? Our Jobs? Jobs? You guys are not computer people, <laughs> I can tell. All right, but why, why do people think of Steve, Steve Jobs or Steve Jobs, however you pronounce the name? Because his way of thinking designed and determined the philosophy behind Apple. If you, if you are, a, you, you are a, a technology person, or even if you use cell phones, you, you realize that Samsung, Apple, um, there is two different systems of how they operate. They can make calls. They both are small computers. But the philosophy behind each is so different. You can't take software from an Apple and put on an Android. You can't take software from a, an Apple computer and it works on a, on, a, on a Windows computer. It doesn't work. Because the philosophy behind each operating system is different. Women tend to love Apple. A lot of men love Apple, but the men who like to do things with their computer, they don't like Apple. They hate it like poison. I am caught between both worlds, but I kind of still prefer to stay away from Apple where my computer is concerned. Because I like to do things with my computer and Apple locks you down that you can only stay within a, very, a little box. Carefully streamlined. They determine what you do, how you do it, when you do it. They take over your computer and they run the system. So it works like a, like a Rolls Royce. It works like a, it's just like a, a silver cubicle. And all you do, you take it out and it runs. You do nothing with it. But if you want to get inside there and do anything, you can't get inside there. But Windows, it gives you access. You can go in and modify your system and make it do different things. Some people like one, some people like the other. It's a, it's a philosophy behind the way the thing works. Now, the operating system, you have the Apple, as I said, and you have one that is called Linux. Most people don't know about Linux. Linux is like, Linux is like a toolbox. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a system for techies, for, for, for people who are technologically savvy. A lot of people don't bother with Linux because it's complicated. You have to understand a little bit about programming. But it's supposed to be very secure, and it's absolutely free. That's the best thing about it. You pay for Windows, you pay for Apple, you don't pay for Linux. You can, I can download several versions of it and put it on my computer. It runs right away. But a lot of the programs that run with the other computer, other systems, it doesn't work with Linux. Um, and of course, there's Windows. Good old Windows, which is what is running the software here right now. So, I'm comparing the operating system to your spirit. Your spirit is the way you function, it's the way the computer functions, and it was designed by the people who designed these systems. Like I said, Steve Jobs, and of course you all know um, Bill Gates, Gates, Windows man. You think of, of Windows, you think Bill Gates. You think of Apple, you think of Steve Jobs. So, the way the system works depends upon the minds of the creators. Now, you can do word processing on Apple, and you can do it on Windows, but not with the same software. The, the Windows software tends to pick up viruses. You have to be very careful. Apple does not get viruses. It's safer, it's more secure, it's more beautiful, it's more streamlined, but you don't have as much freedom. You get what you want, right? Windows, you're free, but be careful for viruses, and the system crashes from time to time, okay? So the, the, the operating system when you get a computer, you don't have any software. You don't have any data. You have to put those on, but you get the operating system. You buy an Apple computer, the operating system is here. Sometimes you get some software, but most of the operating system. Now, when you are born again, what God puts on you is his operating system. That is when you are born again of the Spirit. Your philosophy of life changes. <coughs> your creator or your designer puts a new philosophy. The old system used to pick up viruses. The new system doesn't pick up viruses. You still run the same programs, but you don't run them the same way. Your memory is still there. You can still put data on the system, but the philosophy behind how you use that data is different. So this helps us to understand what is the spirit? It's not the data. 
It's not, the, it's not the software. It's the underlying philosophy that governs and controls you. When I was born again, the information in my mind never changed. I knelt down to pray. With the world on my head, I got up to pray. And I was born. I got up from prayer and I was born again. I knew I was born. I looked at the grass. And it was the greenest I ever saw grass in my life. The sky was a blue out of this world. First time in my life I ever saw that. Something happened inside. 42 years ago, I can tell you the day. I was born, I was born again the 5th of May, 1975. 10 o'clock in the morning. I know because that moment I knew the change. So, what happened to me? Everything in my head was the same. Because I became a Christian because I was, I was in a terrible problem. And when I knelt to pray, the problem was there. And I, when I got up to pray, the problem was there. When I knelt to pray, the problem was on my head. When I got up to, to, from prayer, I didn't care. It was there and I didn't care one scrap about it. What changed? My operating system was different. Something happened on the inside. And it, I didn't hear any voices. Nobody came and put in new data. Something happened. Some, something had come inside and transformed the way I saw life and the way I viewed life and the way I approached life. And it was a miracle. Something supernatural entered my system. That is what it means to be born again. And this is what the Bible teaches. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Bible says that by one offering, uh, Hebrews 7 verse 19, by one offering he has perfected forever. That's Hebrews 10 and verse 14. By one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. He gives you a new spirit like he promised. He gives you a new heart. And that heart and that spirit are perfect. But is your brain perfect? No. You can't be perfect in your brain in this life because it just takes in information. You go down the road and you see all kinds of rubbish. How your brain must be perfect? How your memories must be perfect? Because it's constantly taking in, in, in information even when you're not looking for it. You see half-naked women walking on the street. Information. You hear people cursing bad words. Information. You don't ask for it, but it's bombarding you. You can't get away from it. Your brain system is not perfect and if you try to be perfect from your brain or from your intellectual mind you are in trouble but the bible says if you are born again you are a new creature and it means your operating system in your spirit you are brand new i was born again my character is still under construction but where salvation is concerned god has made me brand new i know i changed because I used to plan how to take revenge on my enemies. After that, I started planning how to help them and how to save them. I know I'm a Christian because I, I, I watch. I know I'm born again because I watch sometimes I watch those court cases. And I see somebody who killed somebody or did something. And then they allow the family to come and make comments. And they say, I wish you were rot in hell. I hope you never get free. I am scratching my head and I'm wondering if I belong to the same race of people. Because something in me is so different. I have none of those desires. I thought if somebody even killed my wife or my child or even my grandson. And the person shows remorse. And even if they don't. Would I, do, I, do I have to be tread against a person for the rest of my existence? It's not in me. Something happened when I'm born again. Being born again means something. It's an act of God. And when God pours his love into your heart, Romans 5 and verse 5, the, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. You have that, I have that because we are Christians. So we don't throw away character development. That's a part of the Christian process, but it is not salvation. It's the way we represent Christ in the world. It's the, it's the way we output the data that is being processed, right? So you have two things working on you. You have the information from your brain, from your thinking, from your, from your information being put in. And that information comes from your body, your senses. And you have the information from your spirit. 
Your spirit is saying one thing to you, and your brain is saying another thing. Which will you listen to? Paul says, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. The problem we have is that we listen too much to the intellectual mind. Okay? Brother Brian, I hear that Brother Brian said, David is a hypocrite. All right, so all the information I have in my mind from the movies I watched and from the people I listened to and from the people I talked to say, put him in his place. Okay? And something inside of me says, be kind to him. Pour out, pour out love upon him. Where are those two voices coming from? People think they're coming from your brain. No, your brain is simply processing data and reacting how the information tells you. But inside of you, the new operating system is giving you a different philosophy of life. It depends on whether you want to walk in the flesh or in the spirit. You still have to make the choice. But at the same time, you now have a tool that you never possessed before. You have the new nature. You are now a son of God. His mind is now inside of you. And when it says his mind, it means a subconscious mind, not the conscious mind. Because God never takes over the conscious mind. You still have the freedom of thought, freedom to take in information. It's that little still voice, subliminal and below the surface. And it's not a voice, it's an impression. It says, be kind. Love him just the same. It's what you choose to listen to. So, I'm going to stop at this point. There are many verses that I could bring to bear to bring out this idea more clearly. But I was very blessed when I came to understand this because it made me deal more gently with myself. Because when I have all these things passing through my mind from my past and I don't... I would tear myself to pieces. I would torture myself. But now I understand, David, it's not you. It's just your processor. Like when that old man that got sick and was cursing God was and cursing his family. You think that was what he was? That was his processor spouting information. He got a virus. And his computer just began throwing out data. Does it mean that his spirit was never born again? But his spirit is not controlling what is happening because he has lost control of his brain faculties. So we could understand when we came to understand is that no, you can't judge him because of what happens when he has lost his conscious mind because it's like when you get a computer you have a computer you would not open a page on the internet with pornography but a virus gets on right and all of a sudden somebody goes on your computer and you see pornography popping up popping up popping up you didn't put it, you didn't have anything to do with that but the virus got on and scrambled your information there and the information is shooting out material that you really don't want to come out but it's happening because you have lost control of the data that exists in that environment. That's what happens when you lose your mind. You don't judge a Christian by, how we, by what happens when they do that. What makes us Christians is the new heart and the new spirit. And yes, character development is our, is our task because my character and how it expresses itself will glorify my Father. But thank God, even if it's not perfect as I would like it to be perfect, I'm still his child. And I will always be his child until I don't want it anymore. Amen. Amen. So God bless you and thank you all for listening. I hope that you have understood what I've been trying to say. Let's bow our heads as we pray.